Hello and welcome to another episode of the Fully Charged Show podcast. Now, one of the great privileges of doing Fully Charged now, as opposed to when it started, is it's got a history. So we first met today's guest uh, at the first Fully Charged Live. He came over from the Netherlands to do a talk about marine engineering. He's a marine engineer and about marine engineering and batteries and electric shipping and all those things, really interesting stuff. That was back in 2018. Um, since then, the company he's founded, and this is all remarkable because of his age, the company he's founded is doing incredibly well, but it's kind of moved from hardware to software. It, he, and it's a really interesting transition and what he's achieving is really remarkable. Uh, you, you, just think of the amount of times you've seen on a building site, a pop festival, a, a, an event, somewhere around the back. You probably haven't seen, because I've done loads of those events, what you always see in the corner is a massive truck, huge thing, parked up, going... You can only just hear it because it's silenced down. That is a diesel generator, or a diesel genset, which is producing the electricity on a remote place, like a festival is a classic example, to run it. And now no one needs to do that anymore. And it's a brilliant business scheme and a brilliant piece of software engineering. And it's just so clever. So this man is called Peter Paul Van Voorst. He runs a company, and I'm going to try and pronounce this in the Dutch way, Schoon, which we would say Schoon with the way it's spelled S-K-O-O-N. If you actually have a look at S-K-O-O-N.com, you'll find it. You'll find out what they're doing, what they're up to, how they power ships who are in docks so they don't have to run their diesel engines and how they use batteries that are transportable to you know, supply power to remote locations. Amazing stuff. Um, before we start that out, just want to quickly remind people who may have stumbled upon this podcast out of... Uh, podcast um, skimming I don't even know how I just hear about podcasts I think that's how I find them isn't that the way but if you have just found this one or someone's told you to listen to it please do subscribe to it because um, then you won't miss it because we do have amazing guests if you find me incredibly annoying uh, I'm not on every episode <laughs> and also we have really interesting people on who aren't me that I might talk to but I'm really trying to shut up more and more Occasionally I get it wrong and I blab on too much. Um, we're going to cut those bits out. But uh, So please do subscribe to this. And if you don't know about the Fully Charged show on YouTube and shortly on Amazon Prime, then uh, if you just Google Fully Charged show, you will find it. It's on YouTube. We've been going for over 10 years now, over 600 episodes about renewable energy, electric vehicles, the energy transition, the Energiewende, if you're a German. And I, boy, did I butcher that <laughs> word. <laughs> but it means the en energy change over the energy transition, which is what we're all living through at the moment, which is really a beacon of hope in an otherwise fairly bleak landscape around the world. Anyway, enough of that waffle. Please welcome to the Fully Charged Show podcast, Peter Paul Van Voorst. My Energy is putting the I back into British innovation. My Energy is putting the I back into inventing the future. My Energy is putting the I back into inspiring a nation. Recharging the world with green smart energy. Charge your EV with your PV and more. Visit myenergy.com and help to spark the green revolution. My Energy. Driving the charge to a greener future. So, Peter, uh, so I'm my memory then of you being at Fully Charged Live in 2018 was, I mean, I just got so excited when I heard what you were doing and what your plans were, which I think we would have heard a couple of years before that. And it was one of those um, frustrating things that we couldn't see, yeah. you know. You that see we this? Couldn't, yeah. Yeah, it's the, the ship. Oh, that's the ship. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it was just that, you know, the, the, I think the thing that surprised me the most, so just very briefly go back to like 10 years ago when I got an electric car and I thought, oh, this is interesting. And all oh, you can have solar panels and make your own petrol, you know, <laughs> you can make your own gasoline and drive a car. That was, I was intrigued by that. Never, ever did it occur to me that the, the, the roles that batteries have already taken up now and, and in areas that you would never dream of. And I mean, in particular, because we're going to go and see some of that this year, is uh, 
uh, aeronautics is flight. You know, you did not, I did not think 10 years ago there'll be electric planes. And there's not, they're not going to be quite battery electric planes, I don't think. Yeah. But certainly electrically powered planes are clearly on the cards for really big, com I mean, uh, Airbus, uh, they're obviously spending a huge amount of money. But then yeah. ships, you would think, there's no way you can have a battery in a ship. And, and you and there kind is. of can't, but you kind of can. I mean, that's <laughs> just fascinating what you've been doing. So yeah. can you get me up to date then from 2018 onwards, what's happening with Schoon? Yeah, so uh, uh, we turned three two weeks ago. And uh, I think when, when we were at Fully Charged Live, we, we just turned like we were yeah. half a year. And yes. Like, yeah, <laughs> we were six, were, we were six old, months yeah. old, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we started off from university um uh, both my co-founder and i studied maritime technology right. and uh being engineers we wanted to design and build things and and construct and yeah and, and work with actual hardware uh but actually as we as we were going through that journey of of really making uh full electric shipping uh, possible we, we we found out a couple of things uh, and i i would say the two main things are um one this market is huge it's it's incredible if if we're able to to get this done it's such a big market yeah. and then our role as a young small company um just doesn't come out well when we continue to focus on the hardware only right uh, because that's that's something large companies with a strong balance sheet are typically good at having large fleets of hardware assets uh, and then the second thing was, um, we I think we briefly also covered some of the other opportunities there were with those same batteries that were used for ships, yeah. such as uh, construction sites, festivals, grid balancing, and those things, because they are swappable batteries. And because as soon as the ship comes uh, arrives in the port, you swap out the empty one, you put a full one in, and you take the empty one to another customer. Yeah, we we started to notice a lot of scaling. Um, barriers, a lot of barriers that would uh, slow down either our own scaling capabilities or those of other companies that would decide to invest in hardware. And we saw that most of those uh, barriers could be taken away by developing software, by developing software that would uh, make it simpler, easier, more data driven, more automated, more uh, everything uh, buzzword around software. Um, and that was actually something that we could make a difference in, uh, being young people, being uh, also trained in thinking in ways of software, thinking in, in terms of, of uh, the connection between hardware and software. So we decided to go full on software. And um, this, this decision was, uh, was also combined with, we want the software to be built on actual real world experience, not just on, we're gonna put sticky notes on the wall and we're gonna have fun. No, yeah. we wanted this to be software that actually fits uh, the, the demand, the actual demand that there is in the market. So we did decide to follow through on the hardware projects we started. So I can tell you that nowadays we do have a working swappable battery container Right. Uh, with 600 kilowatt hours of uh, maritime approved battery cells. Wow. Um, uh, we do have a trailer also, which is really cute. It's just a, like a trailer you can throw behind your car, 30 kilowatt hours. We use for like fun projects, for, for, uh, for marketing purposes. And, yeah. and also just to get the, the, like the, the cold water fear uh, away yes. with people, just to introduce them to, yeah. to it. And yeah, it's been great. Uh, the software, we, we launched a marketplace, an online marketplace where also other battery owners, or I have to say mostly other battery owners, uh, list their batteries, uh, Airbnb style, you list your asset, wow. you make money on our marketplace, and we make everything easy for you. Um, wow, so this is like, I mean, uh, when you say people who are, about, are you talking about individual like homeowners with batteries in their houses or is this mainly businesses with batteries? Yeah, this is mainly businesses nowadays. Right. So this is, you could, you could split them up in two groups, one being uh, like dedicated rental businesses right. that uh, invest in fleets and rent them out uh, using our software and, and, and also using their own software and combining all of those. Uh, or uh, owners like construction companies. They also own some diggers, some excavators, some, some machinery and some batteries. And uh, uh, on the side, if they don't need the batteries, they, they want to make money on them, yeah. uh, but not be bothered with the whole rental management and all those things. 
Wow, that is very interesting then. So that facilitates, I mean, it's just one of those things where, you know, I've explained this to people, uh, you know, on building sites, right? You know, they go, well, we've got nowhere to charge it. I say, well, you can bring a battery in and have, oh, I don't know, you know, all those things. And then you meet people who do do that. So we've, we've met some construction companies where they're using electric uh, equipment and batteries on site that they then take off and recharge. So, yeah. but what you're doing is that next step is go, well, you got this battery, but as we all know, they're not used as much as everyone thinks. You know, it's the same with cars. Yeah, and there, there, I think there are two, two good reasons to, to make them available in the marketplace like ours, which is one, you want to make extra money. Yeah. You don't want the sustainable option to be the premium option. You want it to be the, the cheaper option. Yes. So you want to make money and you can make money. And the other reason is also the the use of of the batteries. Like we, we're gonna we have we have a shortage of batteries already. Yeah. Uh, and that shortage is only gonna grow as automotive continues to take up more and more cells. Yeah. So every battery that comes into the industry, we want them to have an uptime of 100% because yeah. that means that they can serve a lot more customers, and we need less batteries to meet more demand. Right. Because that, I mean, that is an interesting one because you'll very much be at the pinch point of that. So are you aware, is it a kind of acknowledged thing that there, that there's such demand now for batteries that, that say, if you wanted to, say you suddenly had a budget and you go, well, let's buy another 600 kilowatt hour battery. Would that be quite difficult and take time because of the nature of the market? Yeah, it depends on the type of battery you would like to, uh, to use, of course. Yeah. Uh, but the newest batteries, definitely. Uh, right. The, the ones that have a, a high energy density, a high safety um, uh, level, all of those things, that, that those are hard to come by. Right. Uh, wow. And definitely will be uh, as society reopens and uh, we will see the whole energy transition take a flight, another, like, another yes. faster flight. Yeah. No, I think you're right with that. The, I mean, the other question that I can't help wondering is simply because of my recent experience with my Nissan Leaf, there is a probably 18 kilowatt hours of battery capacity in the old pack. I mean, could a, could a company that you work with use that? I mean, obviously that's tiny, but if you had 500 of those batteries, it becomes a sizable proportion of, and they're gonna 18 last for years. 18 kilowatt hour already. We can, yeah. we have film sets that are right. in, in nature, for example, and they want to power their coffee machines and their heaters and, and charge up some camera yeah. batteries. Um, we have uh, construction sites with uh, uh, with smaller uh, accommodation sites, or we have we have all the ranges from one and a half kilowatt hours all the way up to and beyond six hundred kilowatt hours. Right. And um, what we what we do also as as a marketplace as as a data driven uh, company is we we map the different application groups into what their demand is in terms of energy in terms of power, but also in terms of form factor, weight, safety, uh, all of those things, which means that uh, we, we map them uh, in, in, in order of, of difficulty so that your uh, 10 year old 18 kilowatt hour battery has a set of applications where it can make money. Right. So we see that uh, also uh, earlier today, I was talking to a company that is looking to invest in a fleet of batteries for their own purpose but they want to be able to continue updating those batteries. So they take us in the loop from the start. They use their batteries for three years. And after three years, we take them up in the rental um, I fleet. See. Yeah. And, and, and that company is going to offer those batteries so that they can update the batteries for their own use after three years already, instead of having to wait for 10 years. Yeah, yeah. That is really interesting. And also, I mean, this is one of the things I'm aware of from my other activities. Is, is the scale, size, cost, weight of a, a diesel generator on a film set? Because people probably, you know, who haven't worked in that industry probably won't know. But you want, you're out in the middle of some, nowhere where there's no power and you need a lot of power, particularly for lights. Uh, or film lighting uses a lot of power. And so you bring on this really big truck. And the reason it's so big and heavy is that there's a massively noisy diesel engine that you have to make silence. <laughs> Silent, silent. Yeah. <laughs> and the listeners ins with, with the, the insulation <laughs> and the cost of running that and the cost of cooling it and the energy use in cooling it. You know, when if you because that's never been there was never an alternative. It wasn't like oh we're using the diesel because blah blah. Now there's an alternative. I would imagine the cost savings for a film set, for instance. I mean that's a, you know in global terms a tiny 
energy use, but in, in terms of that, but it's got to be a massive saving because it's going to be cheaper. Because you, for one thing, you don't have to make it quiet. I've never heard a noisy battery to this day. There might be one. I don't know. Yeah, if you listen really well to yeah. the fan that's cooling it, maybe. But, <laughs> you can, yeah, but you've got to be right next to it. Yeah. yeah. But that is very interesting then that the, that they, yeah, you know, and, even, and those uses, there'll be dozens of uses like that, I'm sure. And that's just yeah, one I'm familiar with. They're just small details that you don't think about until you realize them. But yeah. even even pulling cables, because a film set needs to place a diesel generator further away so the microphones yes. don't pick it up, that costs hundreds of meters of cables. Yeah. And, and the cost of renting those and putting those down, uh, that's that's a thing. But also the safety. Uh, yeah. uh, all those cables are an, an additional tripping uh, risk. Yeah. So on construction sites, uh, a very high percentage of accidents is... Uh, people are tripping over wires. Wow. So if wow. you just have some portable batteries that you can take with you, uh, rent those, yeah. uh, uh, take them with you to the to the one side of the construction site. Yeah. That's a very easy way of having electricity everywhere. And that's pretty yeah. much what we do is having electricity everywhere, very reliable and very data driven also so that the next time you rent, you don't necessarily have to rent the same battery, but we can say, well, we, we've seen that your demand is is half of what you expected, so you can have a cheaper battery. Yeah. In that way, it's cheaper for you, and that uh, uh, more expensive or stronger battery is available for somebody else. And that's what we're constantly trying to make sure, is that you, as, a, as an end user, you always have a fitting solution, and not just batteries, also uh, uh, mobile fuel cells. Right. Uh, mobile solar panels, those are all things that are uh, continuously being added to the list of clean energy solutions. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, the end goal is to do it without any emissions. Yes, yes, exactly. I mean, that's, yes, that's a very important aspect of it. But I mean, the battery, and in fact, I think it's fair to say the battery and compressed hydrogen facilitate that. I mean, that, you know, if, as long the as grid. the hydrogen and the grid, but I mean, as long as the, the, you know, my argument with the hydrogen is where does the hydrogen, you know, you can't make, you know, you, there's always criticism about electricity being produced by burning coal, which, you know, it is a bit. But in, my, in the UK, it's almost none. It's, it's, it's under 2%, but, you know, around the world it is. But then, so people go, hydrogen is the answer. Well, if, if the hydrogen is coming out of natural gas, it's kind of an argument. It's, it's a mute point. But, you know, there are, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be um, neutral on that. Yeah, and, and but, we but always then, so, it, it, is fuel cells a, a, a technology that you've you're involved with and you're doing stuff with? I mean, yeah, definitely. Because what we right. how we always uh, go about these challenges is uh, we we look at the power demand. What is the maximum power demand? That's what we meet with batteries. Right. And then what's the capacity demand? And that's what we meet with either the grid, always preferably the grid, and if not a hydrogen fuel right. cell. Yeah. And uh, and that's the combination. So a lot of people say, is it batteries or hydrogen the future? No, it's it's, it's both, them together, yeah. and and they yeah. both serve a different purpose. Yeah. And they're both very multi-purpose. So there's definitely a lot of uh, uh, good business to be made with both of them. Right. Because then I mean the the I suppose the key thing is so I've it, it's a really hard thing to get your head around. So when I first came across electric vehicles, it was the kind of the notion and the engineers I spoke to at the time and the companies I went to see and all that, it was the electrification of ground transportation was the kind of goal in a way because it's the low hanging fruit, it's the easiest one to do. And, and so I've always been kind of interested in the other, so like having an electric digger, I had an electric digger here, it's just, brilliant. that was brilliant. And I'm getting some <laughs> more. like a lot of fun. Yes, it was. <laughs> I'm getting, I'm hoping to get access to some more. There's some, since then, huge developments. Here. Because I think what happens is those very, very conservative companies that produce those machines, I'm saying conservative with a small C, but you know, they have to build a big, strong machine that's reliable because they're expensive and they have to last a long time and all this. They have gone. Oh, the electric stuff actually works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> because their machines were rebuilt by other smaller companies, mostly. Yes. That they yes. suddenly saw something with their logo going electric, and yeah, yeah. Well, no, they're they doing it themselves now, and I mean, it is that thing yeah, where that, that understanding of the maintenance of something like a digger on a building site, you know, when a, a diesel because engines go wrong i mean i think that's the thing that we've we've got used to and it's we've grown up with it being normal is that combustion yeah. engines wear down break need spare parts yeah. 
for ever. Take you know? time and, 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 and are noisy. And... Yeah, an electric vehicle, electric machines, doesn't matter what they are, they don't. They just keep working. They're quite boring, yeah. I think. Yeah. They're, they're more yeah. boring. <laughs> they're just yeah, they really... can get bored, I would, I would imagine, yeah. yeah. No sound, no, uh, no, no rumbling. No vibration, no, yeah. no. No, but I, and I also think when you, like when we're making the connection with EVs, EVs is, was mostly about comfort and, and, and the, the average user uh, liked the comfort of an EV, but in the B2B setting, in, in the construction sites, for example, it's not only about comfort, it's, about, it's mostly about cost, but also about even being able to win tenders. Yeah. And that's what we see as a huge driver here in Holland for electrification is the requirements they have in tenders for sustainable alternatives. Right, and then it's not just about the comfort or being the coolest in the neighborhood. It's it's about winning business, doing business. Right, and I think that's why in the B two B atmosphere, it's gonna it's gonna go a lot faster than yeah. it has gone in the B two C world. Yes, I mean I think we're seeing that. We're certainly seeing that in this country, and I'm sure in the Netherlands as well with uh, fleet vehicles. So you know, there's just, we've just been heard from a, an Amazon warehouse here that has a thousand electric vans yeah. and they just, and they, when did they have them last week? You know, they like arrived. So it's gone that when that switches over, when that stuff flips over, it's not like there's a man down the road has got a Renault Zoe. <laughs> <laughs> it's suddenly, there's, uh, how many have you got? A thousand. How many are you getting next year? 20,000. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, that it's incredible. Scale. Well, the numbers we're talking about here, but it's, it's because the technology is, it's completely ready now. It's been tested in B2C, yes, I would say. Exactly. And, and proven and people see it in their personal lives. Uh, the same way also that uh, from a marketplace perspective, from a, from a software marketplace, online marketplace, we, we also see that a lot more people are moving online now because they've seen yeah. it in their personal lives and now they, they want to use it in their B2B space, in their work as well. They, they don't want to be stuck with the old stuff. Yeah. They want to move on and, and do it more efficiently, do it with less emissions. And yeah. But I mean, it is time. interesting what you're saying is that the, it's, you know, the, the, my, my understanding, because I'm old, is very analog. But, you know, I can absolutely get you have a big box that has got lots of uh, batteries in it and you take it somewhere and you put a wire out of it and you run things that you would normally have had a diesel. I get that. And what the next step that's actually way more important, because then you could do that with a vehicle. You can make a crude electric vehicle. It's got a big battery and the wires go to an electric motor and you've got a controller that goes fast, slow. You know, yeah. <laughs> that is, you could do it. It would work. It would be lethally dangerous and uncontrollable, but you know, you could do it. But and what you need in that, in between that is software. I mean, it's really interesting that you've gone that route because there's then it opens up so many other possibilities of how you use it. And for me, software is still that thing that, gentlemen your age do i have no yeah, and, idea and we see that a lot and and also that software is just one thing they, like people yes. come to us and say oh this is your competitor because they also do software and batteries yeah. it's like no that's a battery management software and we do yeah. the commercial side and and like you right. have to you have to get down to the details uh but what we what we mostly say is is you want to you want to have energy and you want to have clean energy we'll make it as easy for you to get mobile clean energy as it is to book a hotel room right and right. booking a hotel room is something you do in your personal life i i hope yeah. that you, when you go uh, on your trips you you do it online yeah and it's the same thing yeah. and a lot of people just have had this big split between personal life and having everything online and on your phone and everything yeah and work where everything is in excel and whiteboards and and yes. uh, windows xp and uh, that that is slowly coming together thanks yeah. to also working from home yeah um but also because uh, more of people of my age and a bit older are getting into decision making positions and, and just say yeah. guys we're, we're done with the old fashioned stuff we need to move on we need yeah. to um, leverage all the uh, opportunities we have with the data because yeah. with the data you get from a battery you can you can do beautiful things the, yes yeah the new business model that you can uh, calculate with that the uh, the lifetime uh, value you can get out of a battery just by uh, analyzing the data and making sure that it's in the right area that it's the right size that it right. has the right converters that it has everything right that's and i mean do you think then from a purely economic point of view completely regardless of environmental aspects or where the batteries come from or the length of life just from an economic point of view, if you're a company, say, with a big distribution warehouse in the Netherlands, 
and you want to and you've got a big roof and you put a lot of solar panels on the roof and you've got room to put a very big battery if your if your software and your company is is aiding them to make money out of that battery is it does it become an economically sensible viable thing will they will they make more money than it's cost them to to install that yeah if they if they use a mobile battery then definitely yes um, ah, so what you're talking about then is so what would be great is if they had a, a, a battery in a container that at the weekend when they're not using it they put it on a truck and it goes somewhere and it gets exactly right yeah because so, that's that's also what we see all over the world is is uh we're, we're installing megawatts hundreds of megawatts of batteries yeah um and that are all waiting for that one moment that they're needed and that right. one moment we see it coming we yeah. know when the sun is going to shine excessively we know the, when the wind is going to blow we know all those things days in advance yeah and that's that's how we can start to form a flexible layer around the electricity grid if we make those units all mobile be it containers be right. it trailers be it portable ones yeah um, and and call on them if they're needed for whatever uh, right. uh, position and in that we're going to and uh, have a higher utilization rate of all those uh, precious yeah. um, assets we have uh, but we're have, we're going to have a higher and also more efficient availability so yeah. you will always have a battery that fits your need and not just uh, a big battery even though you need a very small one yes yes because that's the, that's got to be the difficulty isn't it is that when i uh, that was a discussion i had recently that you know i have a tesla model 3 because they Tesla won't tell you what size batteries, but I'm guessing around 75 kilowatt hours. It's the long range all wheel drive. Yeah. I think it's about 75 kilowatt hours on an average week. So particularly at the moment, I mean, it's more extreme at the moment. On average week, I'm probably using 25, 30 kilowatt hours. You know, in uh, if it was that size, I would be able to use it without any hassle. I plug it yeah. in here at night and I drive it in the day and then it comes, you know. And so you're then realizing, oh, I'm hauling around around 50 kilowatt hours of batteries for no reason for that yeah. two times a year when I really, yeah. and that is a hard thing. That's a yeah. difficult one to. to yeah. To, and, and the reason why vehicle with. to grid is, can be challenging to, to uh, account as a reliable layer around your grid is because it's unpredictable. We don't yeah. know when you're going to do your shopping. We don't know I when see. you're going to see your parents. Yeah. But in our fleet is, is a fleet of B2B assets that right. uh, we we provide software also for rental management, which also um, uh, makes sure that all the availability is known. So we right. know on an hour basis where an asset is going to be. Right. When a new booking comes in for say a festival, that's that's put into the booking system, and the booking system then knows that's when it's not available for, for example, grid connection services. Right. So you can you can see us as like the uh, the the reliable base load of the vehicle to grid network right with the trailers with the containers that we yeah. uh, will have and and have today because i mean that's the, i guess that's the next step i'm just on a report about um buses uh, school buses in new york that are uh, experiment it's, you know as always it's a tryout but it's interesting there's five school buses, which of course are dormant for about 90% of every day because they only do the morning and evening school run. And they are on vehicle to grid systems in uh, in upstate New York. It, 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 peculiarly, it's an area of uh, America that I've spent some time in because of yeah. very good family friends who live in, in White Plains in, in New York state. Um, but the, the, you know, the trucks that, that it, the whole thing just kind of scales up because the trucks that move the containers not today, but fairly soon, I would think in the next five years, will very likely be electric, will very likely have yep. very large, I mean, huge batteries, probably yeah, well. megawatt hour batteries rather than kilowatt hours. Yeah. And I mean, if they've got vehicles to agree, you know, you could drive a truck to a festival and you've got, I don't know what, 400 kilowatt hours, hours in, on yeah. the trailer and you've got another one megawatt hour in the truck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, to power the whole party. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's that's a very good example of of a reliable uh, base load that we're going to need. Yeah. Also, as and and this is a very interesting uh, point of view that I learned last year is, as as climate change also forces us uh, to to think more flexible, uh, with uh, the the Californian forest fires <clears throat> that were caused by the large grids, we need to localize our grids. 
Right. And we need to we need to uh, be more flexible so as to be able to always provide electricity, but not in a way that when climate changes we cannot adapt. Yeah. So installing uh, cables everywhere is 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 a way but in those areas where you need climate adaptation because climate change is already happening yeah it's a place where you don't know or it's it's too dangerous to install large grids yeah and and that's where where also these mobile grids come in very handy yes because that's i mean i think that's you know the aspects that we've all got used to because it's the infrastructure we've inherited you know, when I see there's a there's an area about 20 miles south of me where there's two huge uh, strings of pylons, we call them, you know, they're really, uh, they're very high voltage yeah. uh, connections. And you see those and you go, there's got to be losses in that. It's making, when you're underneath it, you can hear it. <laughs> and you think nothing makes a noise unless energy is going somewhere else. There's yeah, something happening yeah. here. That's energy <laughs> flowing away. <laughs> energy being thrown away. Yeah. And I mean that you know, and those are in this country. They really, there's nowhere the same as in the Netherlands. It's not that far for anything to go because they're not very big yeah. countries. But you know, imagine. I mean, I've seen the equivalent in the United States or in Australia, where they're doing thousands of miles. The yeah. losses are mind-boggling. Yeah, and when the wind is too strong, they start swaying and they, they start, start sparking, and that that's when the forest fires come. Yeah. But that's that's an interesting uh, point also because what we see, our grids are are kind of a one-way street. Yeah. They're, they're built to be a one-way street and what we're yeah. trying to do now is is push cars in both ways yeah. and of course they meet in the middle and they and they get in a fight and and whatever so yeah. i was i was explaining i was trying to explain to my family kind of what we what we do on the grid side and we came to this uh to this uh, comparison that um what we what we are is is we have we have the one-way street that's there yeah uh, and let's use it at, at the best and what we provide is just two parking lots on both sides uh, to to buffer the capacity and and a communication system so that one can say we're coming your way now so don't don't enter and and right kind of a yeah what we what we try to do is is leverage the quality of the current uh, network and make sure that we don't have to invest billions in it to make it a two-way street because yeah. if we have to do that all over the place uh, that's all going to be pretty expensive and yeah. take a long time yeah because I don't know what the uh, uh, electricity generating mix in the Netherlands is. I've got, I haven't got a clue. Now I think about. It, I mean, I absolutely know it's got some wind because I've seen it, seen the wind turbines. Got some wind. Yeah. <laughs> got some wind. Like yeah. everywhere you look, there's wind turbines. But I don't know about a particular. There's an amazing road. I've only driven on it once, and I want to go again. That's on a dike on the North Sea coast. That's just. That's for me. Yes. Yeah. That is the most extraordinary sight. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're yeah. they're up upgrading those. Oh, are they? Now. Yeah. Because they were, uh, I don't know, many years ago. Yes, that old, was a and... while ago I saw them. Yeah. That wasn't recently. Yeah, yeah they've yeah. been there ever since I can remember, which right. is not that long. But um, uh, yeah, it, it is, they are upgrading them. And, and yeah, we have a lot of wind here, so it makes sense. It doesn't mean that we have a high uh, percentage of green electricity. Uh, right. We're actually almost at the bottom. Oh, really? Because, um, I mean, because always Denmark's cited as being, the, you know, the windiest the most wind i don't know how true well they certainly mail all the wind turbines that we our british national government that waves flags constantly talks about is british offshore wind it's yeah. all built by a danish company yeah <laughs> exactly <otherwise>. yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's true and, and they are the best and and there are some good dutch companies that yeah. do the installation itself so we don't build the windmills that much but we uh, we do the installation yeah. and i think we we've been able to see it through our office window we had the biggest wind turbine here it, for, for a little docks. while oh is it not there now is it gone uh, no i i don't know if it was this one uh, or that there, it's still there but let's say it's still there and and yeah. so we have the biggest one but it's just one uh, right. but we have the huge offshore wind parks of course and yeah. and and, uh, and and yeah there there's definitely good progress um yeah but yeah it is it is a challenging thing being a flat country no hydropower yeah um, and yes uh, being you limited in space that. We have a lot of solar which is not connected because solar is installed in areas that uh, where the ground is cheaper and where the ground is cheaper you don't have big grid connections right so the grid operators here actually said please don't uh, build any solar fields anymore because we cannot take, connect we can't them. take it yeah no that we've reached that point in the area of the country with the northern end so the southwest of the uk yeah. is sort of yeah. saturated with solar you know even it is a lot of it they there but actually there's always an argument then you know one engineer from the 
energy distribution company will go, we can't take any more, there's too much solar. <laughs> and then someone who actually knows, who works for the national grid goes, it's not, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's, I think, the difficult thing. And, and you have a very good point there. It's, it comes down to the people so much. Absolutely. And, and yeah. how the people think. And we've yeah. been talking to all the grid operators here for, uh, for years now. And at some point I was asking, like, we've been talking for so many years. And every time we talk, you're all excited. Yeah. But we haven't realized any like tangible project. Why is that? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, we're organized to put copper in the ground. And yeah. wherever we find ways to do that more efficiently, we don't care because our job is to put copper on the ground. And that's our job by law. Yeah. So um, wherever we get a, a request for five megawatts, we will not ask maybe you need three megawatts and you yeah. can use a battery for that yes. day that you need five. No, no, we have to install five megawatts. <laughs> so in that, we're, we're, uh, we're with a lot of companies and, and with the help of, of actual professionals, we're trying to get that way of thinking from power towards capacity. Yeah. Because if, if we're able to do that, we'll make sure that you always have the right power. Um, and, yeah. and, and there are already enough mobile batteries available um uh, for the different power ranges and that uh, fleet is just going to grow uh, every day is so it, it is a side of it that is that i hadn't thought of before which is the utilization of the asset which i like that because it sounds a bit like the born identity you know when in the or the born movies they're always yeah. going send in the asset which is the man who tries to kill him you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i've got to remove that i'm not talking that sort of asset i'm talking batteries but the idea that you, you, you know you, i mean i think i think in a domestic because my only experience is in a domestic setting so in my house i've got batteries well they are in use every single day they're charging and discharging every day there's they're not like sitting there dormant for three months but if you've got a big company and a big capacity battery which is for kind of emergency use because we had a power cut yesterday for 30 minutes here we're because we're on a dodgy old grid because we're in the country yeah. uh, you know so that's brilliant we don't we didn't know till after it happened that it, yeah. it, that happened but um so if you've got a bit if you've got a big company you want to have that protection if you're running machinery 24 hours a day and it suddenly stops things go yeah. badly wrong yeah. but then you're not using that you've got that you could have that battery there half charged for like a year doing nothing total yeah. waste of time yeah, but at waiting, the moment waiting they, to make money yeah. yeah but at the moment though if that's a built-in you know a very big capacity battery you're not dealing with that, that, no, that we always deal with a combination or uh, um or a transition period for example a lot of users here uh when they request a grid connection it takes some weeks or in some cases many months for that grid connection to arrive but there is something right so what we do then is is we rent out a battery for a couple of months uh, between the moment that they start their supermarket business or their uh, scooter sharing business uh, to the point that they get the grid connection. Right. And, and from that moment on, they can use the grid connection. So it's a lot for these temporary places, but also, for example, to uh, uh, we, we work with the ports a lot, Port of Amsterdam and Port of Rotterdam, and they're installing shore power in many locations. Right, but you can imagine uh, um, when you have a, a kilometer of of uh, birth, or is that how you call it in British? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah birth. Then, uh, where where do you put the the plugs? Where do you yes. where do you let the uh, uh, the charger uh, come out of the ground? Yeah. So then, what we do is we we use batteries for let's say three years or two years to uh, to provide that shore power. And then after three years, we can look back and say, this is the, this is the, the place yeah. where we've put it the most. So that, that's the place where most chips have their shore power cable yeah. already. And uh, I think that I would love you to explain that just briefly to our listeners, just because it's, you know, that is, you're, you're a maritime engineer, you know what you're talking about. But, you know, we, the, we, I think most people would understand a ship goes across the ocean and it's got a big thing in it going, <laughs> which is an engine that's burning really dirty fuel but when yeah. it gets to a, a port those engines or a lot of they're still burning oil to maintain all the systems on the ship so they you know they might turn i don't know if they turn the very big marine engines off there's engines no, so running have, yeah they have every ship has several uh, several engines uh, most of the time especially for the ocean going vessels they have a 
um, an engine directly connected to the propeller to uh, to drive forward and then in another place in the ship they have generators yeah uh, they, those can be any size uh, right. so for example in, in amsterdam we've used our battery container a lot for river cruise vessels right. uh, that go down the rivers and uh, what they what they also have is uh, two uh, direct drive uh, engines and then two generators right um and what they have is is when they when they arrive to the uh, port um they uh, uh they have to connect to shore power there are cities more and more cities that say right. you have to connect and that's but, so they can turn their generator engines off but run yeah. off the battery power. right yeah run off the grid but those grid connections are often unreliable and yeah uh, when they when the grid connection fails it takes a minute for the emergency generator to turn on and that's a right. group of unhappy customers on your Evergrace vessel. Yes, yes. So even imagine. just having a battery there to cover that one minute, or even yeah. to cover everything, we've covered yeah. ships that that the battery was the only energy source for the whole for the whole vessel. Right. Um, just to have a reliable, clean energy source. That's a. I think that's a big win that we can have as an industry as a whole. Yeah. Because we like we're. The new new technologies are now into fill maybe or to to not get to your range or not. So we're working a lot on reliability, on yeah. uh, visibility, on making sure that people actually trust and have comfort with the system. Yeah, uh, that's also what we have our own batteries for, um, so that when they have the comfort and the level of trust they need, uh, that then they can switch to the whole entire fleet of batteries that you can book on our marketplace. Right. So that's a yeah big development. Yeah. But that so that's when uh, at the moment then you could you could say that uh, the technology is developed to such an extent that I mean we've seen this in uh, the Orkney Islands in Scotland uh, uh, yeah. on their dockland they're running uh, you know I suppose uh, ship to sh or sh shore to ship electricity from hydrogen they're using uh, fuel cells for that which is an amazing system and that's been very successful and that is because the ships are in, right in the middle of a very this is the ferries right in the middle of quite a small town i mean that's literally you're in your kitchen and you open the window and there's a huge ship right outside you know and it's yeah. that close it goes right into the town but the at the moment we've been on one very large ferry from uh denmark to sweden that was 100 percent electrically powered had batteries yeah. in containers on them but i mean i'm just wondering from your knowledge of maritime engineering because that clearly works and the way they charge that either end was fascinating and it's doing it's doing i think it's a five or six kilometer crossing it's not very far yeah. but it is a i i before we got there i thought it was going to be like the ferries that would go to an island off vancouver that camp yeah. eight cars on yeah. And you're outside. <laughs> it was a massive ship with loads of trucks. It was a yeah. really big, proper ferry. Yeah. So that was, and that what was extraordinary about that is, with my minimum understanding of, of maritime engineering, I've been on plenty of ferries across the channel, and you can hear even if you're upstairs in the bar, you'll hear, you know, this low rumble, which is the end. In this yeah. thing, we were standing talking, and it was. Then you looked out and went, "Oh my God, we're moving!" We're moving. You had <laughs> no idea. There was yeah. no vibration, no nothing. It was, a, you know, and that was extraordinary. But yeah, and I think that's also like as a software company, it's a bit strange that we have a battery container ourselves. Yes, but we just want to prove that it that it's work. possible, and it is. Yeah. And yeah. we have the technologies and. Definitely not to cross the ocean to the United States or well, that's to, go what, to China. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask is what, what what alternatives do you see emerging? Like I'm talking in the next 10 to 15, 20 years yeah. to to burning bunker fuel in a diesel marine engine. Yeah. So what we see in general, uh, one of our investors is Diamond Shipyards, the biggest shipbuilding company in Holland. And and they also say like the, the drive system, the drive shaft will be driven by an electric engine. Right. So we will have electric, electrical drives yes. for the propellers. The energy source is going to be uh, electrons or molecules, and and definitely for seagoing vessels, there will be molecules, right. uh, for sure, because of the energy density. And uh, whether that is hydrogen directly or a hydrogen carrier like ammonia, uh, uh, that's to be seen, and that's that depends on which route you are uh, sailing on. Yeah, it depends on what type of ship you are, what type of car you have. Uh, but the, the biggest thing is is ammonia uh, and right. hydrogen. Uh, we have LNG as like a in, an in-between 
yeah. uh, which is which is okay, but definitely has its downsides. Yeah. Um, but it's a good. I think it's a good process to go through the LNG learnings and yeah. apply well, it, those you know, to yeah. hydrogen and ammonia. Yeah, I mean, in a way, it's the same. It's like shipping is currently in the position that ground transport was in in say the mid 1990s, where someone developed a hybrid. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was that kind of oh, that's exciting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, with, you know, but I mean, what I what uh, what I'm intrigued at what, when it goes up to that scale, like I've filmed on a, I, I don't think it was the biggest, but certainly one of the biggest container ships in the world. Absolutely mind numbing. Yeah. And we did, we made a whole program about how they load the containers and take them off and which ones go where and all that stuff. And but then I went on the ship when it left the dock, uh, and. I asked the captain, who a really lovely Malaysian guy, I said, how, how many gallons <laughs> does it use to get moving? Because we'd been sitting still. They, I, I'd seen all the, the, the ropes come off. It wasn't tied up. And I heard <laughs> this engine going. Yeah. And then and they let me go <laughs> with the big horn, which was the yeah. big thrill of my life. Um, and then nothing moved. We weren't moving. Uh, you know, and, it took, and then you could see water swirling around in between the, the ship and the dock. And then very slowly it started moving. So that's when I asked him, yeah, I'm going, that's used. And he said, yeah. we don't measure it in gallons. He gave me a little pat on the back. We don't measure it in gallons. Yeah. We measure it in tons. Yeah. It's about 40 yeah. tons of bunker fuel to get this bloody thing. I mean, once yeah. it's going, it, it's fine. Yeah. It doesn't yeah, stop. Yeah, yeah, and, and it is it is incredible, the size. And, and yeah, I've been on similar ships as well, where you go in the engine room. And oh. the, the engine is a building. It's yeah. bigger than your house. And oh, much bigger. These yeah. cylinders that, I don't know, we, you could fit a family in there. Yeah. Um, mm. It is it is good to be uh, to, to say also they, that is because they can transport a whole lot of things. Huge amount. You would yes, replace the, that by the, the, an equivalent of trucks that, that would yeah. be terrible. Yeah. But still, like the challenge is huge. And yeah. I think one of the biggest challenges the shipping industry faces is these ships are built for decades. Yes. And uh, trucks, buses, uh, cars are built for, for several years and maybe yeah. maybe buses longer than, yeah. uh, than any other. But uh, to replace a ship is an investment of 30 years at least yeah, and right. to then decide we're going to make an investment in a zero emission vessel yeah. that's quite a big uh, yeah. decision to take and it's also why we came up with this this modular system that you can you can go along as technology develops right. yeah. you can get better uh, energy sources you can get better better whatever uh, you need for your ship to to go along with technological development yeah because I'm just what I was wondering though is the driving force behind that is the regardless of any opinion or uh, dispute about materials or batteries or electric vehicles or anything else. One thing that is just it's just not an arguable point is if you have a kilowatt hour of energy in the form of petrol, yeah. uh, you know that you you measure its its potential uh, energy source as a kilowatt hour you go further on a kilowatt hour in an electric car than you do in a petrol car, a lot further. I mean, it's yeah. a mind boggling improvement. Yeah. And whether that, those, those, uh, you know, improvements in, in economics would, would re apply in the same way to shipping. Cause I, I would imagine, a, you know, a ton of bunker fuel is very cheap in comparison with a ton of refined gasoline. You know, yeah. it's going to be much cheaper, yeah. but, would there be the same economic savings, you know, regardless of the cost of the actual technology or no, not economic savings. Would there be a, an increase in efficiency? Will it use less megawatt hours per nautical mile than we definitely. do currently? I would think it I mean, definitely by, yeah. by far. Uh, but it is it is the sad truth that uh, uh, the, the fossil fuels are just insanely cheap. Yeah. And, this this has many reasons. One of them, for example, being a treaty that they um, that has been there since and I don't know mid 1900s that there cannot be any tax on fuels that are used for shipping. Uh, I did because not know that. wow. that's a that's a cross border activity and, right. and therefore and how would you tax it? You've got yeah. different countries. Yes. So so what we what we focus on is is two things: is making sure that whatever energy source we offer to these ship owners, that the same energy source is also used for uh, construction sites, events, grids, film sets, all those things. So to yeah. to share the costs, uh, and also to focus on those users that have uh, additional reasons to switch to full electric. 
right. such as having a customer that that needs sustainable transport. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and we definitely see that uh, more and more big companies, uh, Amazon, you mentioned them before, yeah. IKEA, all those companies, they want zero emission uh, supply chains. Yeah. And uh, then the shipping industry can can take a long time and say it's not possible. It's not possible. But if yeah. If Amazon says it's we want it, and if you don't do it, we're going to do it ourselves. Yeah. That's going to happen, and what they did with Rivian as well. Yes, like, they're just going to buy a company and yeah, uh, order how many was it? A hundred thousand. Hundred thousand. The first. Yeah. That's the first order. There's the first one order. Coming. Yeah, <laughs> and I think that that's going to change a whole lot because yeah, electric assets are just so much simpler to use. Yeah, and so much simpler to manage because you can manage everything from a distance. Yeah. Uh, for example, with our software. Yeah, because I'm just wondering whether, yeah, there will be, maybe it could be Amazon, could be Apple, could be, uh, you know, Foxconn, we'll finally go, well, look, let's, we'll do one. We'll do, a, we'll build a container ship that's 100% electric, runs on hydrogen or ammonia. Yeah. It's gonna, we're going to lose a, we're going to lose our shirts on it, one of our shirts, because we've got yeah. a billion shirts, because yeah. we've got a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they, and they, it's like totally uneconomic, but they do it and they go, Guys, this works, you know. Okay. So, you know, I mean, I'm really looking forward to that moment. It, you know, the two moments I'm looking forward to is a scheduled passenger flight in a non-combustion plane. Yeah, was it? And, wasn't it EasyJet that was working? on Yeah. That? Oh no, they're all putting a lot of money into it. Yeah, no, it's yeah. a really big, big thing. I mean, that was that's been the frustration of the last year. The two things we're not talking about: the B word and the C word. But the yeah. C word has stopped <laughs> us filming in. That uh, you know, we've got uh, aircraft manufacturing facilities near us that are developing kind of in-wing, high-pressure tur electric turbines, and I mean, amazing stuff. And we can't go yet. You know, one day we'll yeah. be able to go and see it. But really yeah. interesting. Uh, there, there'll be a um, Red Bull aerobatic plane that I'm very glad only has one seat because I have been in one before, and I never <laughs> want to go in one again. Uh, <laughs> but an, an electric Red Bull That's aerobatic scary. plane is just mind it'll be so much faster than the combustion ones and it flies it's that weird quirk of uh, technology it will fly longer farther and faster than the petrol ones yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, it's, and it's purely electric it's incredibly powerful things but the um i've lost the truck the plot now oh yes the uh, yeah no i'm just wondering whether that i think it is going to be that way because that seems to be what is happening with cars is the real advances in the technology are coming from outside the traditional automotive industry. And you've got That's to it. hope yeah. for the sake of millions of people's jobs and big companies, Volkswagens, Mercedes, all those people, Toyota, really tailing behind. You know, they're being left behind. You know, yeah. my, I don't even, I'm not a Tesla fanboy, but I got in my car the other day. It was totally bloody different and yeah. better because it had, had a software upgrade overnight. I didn't do anything. I didn't yeah. plug it in or log in or put it in a part. It just did it. Yeah. And that where where because it's we have right hand drive, where your hand is when you're steering, yeah. is over the where the speed is a bit. It, so yeah. you'd have to go like that to look how fast you're going. They've moved it. It's not, no way. It's not in the way. <laughs> it's it's just the most stupidly simple thing. Yeah. That made it better. I took it, I didn't take it into a garage. I didn't have it plugged in with a man. I had nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Just parked it and plugged it in at night, and that was it. Yeah, and that extreme focus on what the customer needs and, yeah. and, and knowing what the customer needs, listening to the customer, I think that's yeah. that's a really good it's development. A really, that's a long. I mean, I've driven the Porsche Taycan recently, which is brilliant, but yeah. it's got every it's got that legacy thing, and that's got to be the same in terms of you know that seems to be across the board in terms of energy, in terms of any technology. Yeah. You know, you're exactly what you were saying. You're dealing with in a sense legacy infrastructure. Yeah. And how yeah. does that integrate into no. Yeah, and and what you see behind me is a is a team picture. You see that the oh, yeah. average age. I don't know if you can see it, but they, the average age. Look, there's, is, there's no one that looks like me in that picture. <laughs> <laughs> no, and and I think that that is one of our great strengths. Is yeah. um, we don't have the the uh, the baggage with us that's yeah. gonna uh, limit our thinking. Um, we do have uh, some lack of experience in some places, but luckily enough, we have really good advisors and great investors that. Fill, fill up the holes a bit there right. uh, but to be able to to think uh, fast to be able to take up lots of information um, yeah there was a, uh, a really cool podcast I listened to as well about the Apollo 8 moon landing where the average age of the mission control team was 26 years old 
Is that incredible? Wow. And that was because they were in the mission and they were there to make the mission happen. And yeah. they only had one thing, like they had to win. Yeah. And because they were young, they were able to take fast decisions. Don't think too too long. Don't take yeah. into any account any politics or whatever. Just we have a mission and within 10 years, um, uh, we have to make it to the moon. Well, we have yeah. a similar mission today. Within 10 years, we have to yeah. solve the energy transition. Yeah. And there's no more time. And in the next, no. well, by now nine years, um, yeah. we're going to have to uh, have the whole solution and have it up and running. Yeah. I mean, that's the only, uh, it is really the main, oh, grand, there's two things that really want make me want to stay alive at my age. <laughs> One is my if I might have grandchildren, although both my children have said, don't hold your breath, old man. <laughs> <laughs> so they're not quite ready yet. But then the other one is to is to live long enough to go, wow, look at that. Every bus on this street is electric. Every taxi is electric. Every delivery yeah. van is electric. The, the, the top of the street is covered with solar panels to stop, keep you dry when you're out. Washed. You know, that, you can breathe. Normally. You can breathe. The heck, yeah. that happened? <laughs> I mean, I didn't I, we don't live in London, but our friends who live in London, during March lockdown yeah. last year, they 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 emailed me specifically. They said, I've just breathed in on Oxford Street, right in the middle of London. <laughs> and it smelt like your garden, you know, yeah. like out here, where out in the country. Yeah. And they were, they know people noticed. And I think that's a really key. And I'm sure, I mean, it's going to be exactly the same thing in the Netherlands. You know, that understanding that you have of, I think you're 20 years ahead of us in terms of trans public, personal transportation and, the fact that you all use bikes i mean it's unfair because it's flat because yeah. i live where everywhere i go is bloody hills here <laughs> yeah we but... wouldn't do that <laughs> <laughs> you have to cycle up a hill but yeah. now electric bikes have made that a lot better a lot yeah. easier but yeah definitely but, you know that uh I, that's what i want people to remember after the c word is uh yeah is that we and can also, live like that you know that yeah and also impossible. that it's not for for us it's not about our children it's not about we have to leave it for the next generation yeah. or we're not inheriting it from our grandparents but borrowing it from our children no it's just it's about us it and is actually now yes yeah i tell our team also and uh we're we're also i think on average i'm 27 when most climate goals uh, must be met 2050 yeah uh, i'm still in the midst of my career so yeah hopefully um yes. yes let's assume so but uh i'm still in the midst of my career and, and if i look back in 2050 and and look back and and see oh i should have done that differently yeah. i should have been faster there like we have no time and, no. and like we should be fast and find yeah. every cheat and every um every, every way to uh, to accelerate it no all power to you because i think that is a much better it is a very interesting take and a much better one is is because there is that sort of um I don't know where it comes from, but that thing about which I find annoying because I grew up with hippies, quite a few Dutch hippies, you know, with very long hair, <laughs> very big joints. <sighs> Here you go, have some. <laughs> and um, but you know, they and they were lovely, but they they were they kind of got stuck, and uh, uh, and and it was also about sacrificing. It was about not having. It was about not doing that whole kind in a way the kind of original green movement about we can't burn coal it's bad for you so let's not have electricity we're, we're gonna have candles candles are really really bad you know we're, and it was that kind of go let's go back to medieval times which was at the time in the 1970s very attractive you know yeah. aesthetically very attractive but just dumb yeah and, and i that, think the that, solutions that are there today are better Yes, I, exactly. I don't. I don't have a car because we have electric sharing cars all over yeah. the city here and in the Hague where I live. Yeah, and I don't have any parking stress anymore. No, because I oh. use an electric sharing car. I I un, I lock it with my phone. I yeah. get a voucher for charging it, and then I stop paying. And yeah, it's just and so easy. Your, and you don't have to worry about the, the car. It's not yours. Yeah, and I can choose a different one every day. Oh. Jaguar I pays one day and it's on leave the next and yeah it's it's fun and uh, I think I that's know. that's what we also try to focus on with uh, with for example renting out our, our yes. batteries is yeah. just go to these construction people and say don't you just enjoy the yeah the, the peace and the silence and that you can breathe and yeah but I mean I think that what I was trying to say was that that your generation um, you know apart from that I just love that's the thing I've got the most hope for is that that you go don't really need to own a car. You know, I think cars are great. When it's raining and yeah. it's cold, they're really, really good pieces of machinery. Yeah. <clears throat> but um, and I don't want to own one. I just want to be able to use it when I need it, which is exactly what you do. But it is that 
the the notion of it's it, that in a sense we want your generation to be the most selfish as opposed to the least you know no i don't want to give that i, I want to do it i want to sort this out now for me yeah. it's yeah. i think that is a really really good point i'm not yeah. doing this because that's that kind of holier than thou oh i'm doing this for the good of the planet and my look the planet will yeah. be fine the planet yeah. doesn't give a toss what you do yeah. the planet's okay your grandchildren will hate you anyway because yeah. you've screwed up so All shut right. up about that <laughs> sort it out now for yourself be selfish about it it's actually a very good yeah, I think that's that's the, the, one of the the things that will definitely always be there. Like I'm always going to yeah. be there with myself, and definitely, of course, I also do it for other people. And yeah, yeah, for for everything. But I mean, the thing that uh, that I will always that I can always come back to is what would be best for for myself and for my own environment. Yeah, yeah, um, and and I think yeah, we are we are we are kind of a selfish generation, which definitely is not always a good thing i don't think but, that's that's not exceptional believe me my generation was as selfish <laughs> as hell yeah and i think if we if we are able to to use the energy we get from the selfishness inside of us to do good to, to do good and, and also it's the long-termness i think is the critical thing yeah the lot, it's having a long view is, is the most important aspect. yeah and I, maybe maybe the a better way to say it is is uh, that it is our own responsibility and and it's a huge responsibility we're carrying yeah and uh, the only thing we can do is take our responsibility because uh, yeah we're we're not going to retire before this problem is solved no no we're not going to leave the responsibilities it'll always be with us and yeah uh, we'll always have to uh, yeah ca carry our responsibility and 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 take up whatever we can yeah no, I'm very much hoping that I am still around in 2050. I will be 94. You'll be there. <laughs> and there are, 90, the up there. <laughs> there are 94 year olds around. You know, it does. It is possible. My uh, auntie uh, passed away just last end of last year and she was 100. So, you know, wow. that was amazing. And she was uh, very compass mentis. She was very with us until yeah. the last six, last six months. She was a bit confused. She thought I was her uh, interestingly her dutch neighbor from when she was a child there you go <laughs> yeah the van nesses she went was it oh. the blonde hair or the... <laughs> yeah, I don't, yes, yes. <laughs> it was the fact that i'm six foot ten and blonde hair no i don't know what it was i was very flattered because i saw a photograph of him he was a terribly handsome man um they, like from 1938 she remembered this man from right. i mean he would now be something like 197 years old <laughs> that's <laughs> a long time <laughs> but she thought it was him. no but the, the, and the only last thing i want to say because uh, you've been really generous with your time about this and we've uh, sort of waffled over all sorts of things but uh, this is what i'm praying my, i'm married to an australian so i'm hoping i can maybe live in australia <laughs> <laughs> as a, to retire not yet not yet not now but at some point <laughs> But the other one is that I had my DNA done where you'd put the thing in your mouth and all that. And it, I take very little heed of it. It was a bit generalized. Yeah. But what was intriguing, and we have no idea why in my family, the, the family that we know about is are basically farmers from Wales, uh, yeah. where my name is from. But I am 55% Dutch. There you go. 55%. I mean, that's more, that's more than <laughs> that's <half>. a lot. <laughs> so it's it's actually South Holland, northern Belgium. It's there. There's a little thing. So the only thing we can possibly work out is that my maternal grandmother was a Cockney from London yeah. and could be descended from Huguenots who fled here in 16 wherever. You know, that because yeah, it some, doesn't make sense. That, yeah. I mean, it's what everything else is. I, I wanted a bit of eastern mediterranean a bit of arab a bit of africa something nothing there's nothing <laughs> i'm from the lowlands of the netherlands so yeah. i that's why i think i've now realized i've always had an affinity for the netherlands and i've always loved being that's good there so i think it's in my genetic code that's it you feel at home here really hope you enjoyed that i think uh, uh peter is in a, a remarkable 27 year old what an amazing man what an amazing a series of achievements he's uh, managed so far uh, absolute delight and when we're allowed off this beleaguered island um i can't wait to go and visit them and see what they're up to really exciting stuff so we hopefully we'll get to film an episode at least in the next 18 months if not in the next 12 um, but anyway that's all i'm not going to waffle on anymore as i asked you to subscribe at the beginning i'm not going to say it again 
obviously, if you want to subscribe, you can. No, nothing, no pressure, no pressure. All right, that's it. I'm going to shut up. As always, if you have been, thank you for listening.